clerk's office always has a good showing. Should have retirees more often. We'll have a full, full chambers. <laughs> Make sure you get a picture of that cork. Yeah. I think he's here for this. You may be called for an invitation. Good morning. The Tuesday, April 23rd, 2013, regular Board of County Commissioners meeting will now come to order. We'll have an invocation by Pastor Billy McLeod. Is, is Pastor here? We will have an invocation by Commissioner Wesley Davis, and I'll then lead us in the pledge. Commissioner O'Brien is absent. He's in Tallahassee. Please rise. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have. We thank you for the freedoms we enjoy. We, we thank you for the, the security that, that we, we have in our community and knowing we can do better, Lord. Thank you so much for the opportunity to conduct the public's business. May we use your guidance, your knowledge, and your wisdom in the decisions that we make here today. In your heavenly name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Commissioner Davis. Please join with me the Pledge of Allegiance to the greatest nation on earth. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Gentlemen, any uh, additions, deletions to the agenda and emergency items? Move to the agenda. Second. A motion by Commissioner Davis, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, 4-0. Next item on the agenda is a proclamation and uh, presentation, the presentation of a proclamation honoring Jean Jeannie Bishop on her retirement from the Indian River County Clerk of the Court and Controller. I have the honor of uh, presenting this proclamation, and thank you. Thank the, uh, the clerk's office for having a, a rather robust attendance <laughs> in this auspicious occasion. Good morning, Jeannie. Let's read your proclamation first, but we're looking for a few words from you. Okay. <laughs> Mine are written. Yours are going to come from the heart. This proclamation honoring Jeannie Bishop on her retirement from Indian River County Clerk of the Court and Controller. Whereas Jean, Jeannie, Bishop, Jeannie Marie Bishop is retiring from Indian River County Clerk of the Court and Controller's Office, effective April 25th, 2013. Whereas, Jeannie began her career in the Payroll Department and the Clerk's Office on September 24th, 1994, and has consistently worked in a position for 18 and a half years, and was promoted to Payroll Coordinator. And, whereas, Jeannie worked at, for Keene's Supermarket for 17 years as a bookkeeper and payroll clerk, to her position at the county. And Jeannie was born in Trenton, New Jersey, and raised in Vero Beach, and married her high school sweetheart in 1965. And whereas Jeannie is a mother of three daughters and a grandmother to three granddaughters and one grandson. And whereas Jeannie's ethics, uh, perseverance, commitment and enthusiasm to Indian River County and to the employees of the Clerk of the Circuit Court and the Board of County Commissioners has been greatly appreciated by all co-workers and her employer. Now therefore be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County that the Board applauds Jean, Jeannie Marie Bishop for her loyalty and dedication to this county. Be it further proclaimed that the Board and the clerk and the board extend their heartfelt wishes for success in her future endeavors and a happy and prosperous retirement. Adopted this 23rd day of April 2013, signed by all five county commissioners. Jeannie, uh, it appears we just have a couple more days. <laughs> yes, it's come fast. I, uh, 
I really have enjoyed working. I feel it's been a privilege and honor to be working for the clerk. We are like a family, and I'm going to miss it a lot. You know, no, no final words have been spoken. Um, as I commented, look at this group. You truly work with a family, and uh, I, I guess now you'll be having a little bit more time to commit to those grandchildren and uh, enjoy. Uh, you, you've earned that time, and uh, we wish you all the best from our hearts. Thank you. Oh, oh you, you want to get a picture of the presentation? We, we, we're being... <laughs> Linda wants to make sure you're getting it. Thank you. Enjoy now. Jeannie, come on back. Did you want a picture with the group? Is Can that I? what? That'd be great. Thank you so much. Jeannie, if you want to come up here or stand there, which is you, your preference. Sometimes it's. Yeah, come on up. Come on up. We have a short agenda. Well, you come up. You can sit right there. Well, me. <laughs> we have an open chair. There you go. <laughs> You're on the clerk. Why not? Okay, ready? That's nice. That's real nice. One more smile. Okay, hang on. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Nothing like a little improv for a retirement. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting's over. No. <laughs> thank you once again. Uh, the uh, next uh, proclamation is a presentation of Law Week for 2013 proclaiming Realizing the Dream, Equality for All. And uh, this will be presented by uh, Commissioner Bob Solari. Commissioner Solari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kessner, good morning. Good morning. I'm very happy to read this proclamation recognizing Law Week 2013, Realizing the Dream, Equality for All. Whereas Law Week is a week of public acknowledgement of our nation's and our Florida's heritage of justice, liberty, and equality under the law, and May 1st has been declared Law Day by the United States Congress, and whereas the American Bar Association has declared the theme for Law Week 2013 as realizing the dream, equity for all, and whereas this year's theme recognizes the inextricable link between freedom and equality, the importance of living up to the promise of equality under the law enshrined in our nation's founding documents, and the challenges that remain in realizing that ideal, and whereas the year 2013 marks the 150th anniversary of the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, as well as the 50th anniversary of the March in Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech. And whereas all Americans are entitled to equal protection of the law and to the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners that the board does hereby proclaim April 28th through May 4th, 2013 as Law Week and calls upon the citizens of Indian River County to acknowledge the importance of our legal and judicial systems with appropriate ceremonies and activities and to display the flag of the United States and Florida in support of this educational observance. The board further encourages the schools, businesses, media, religious institutions, civic and service organizations to join members of the bar and bench in commemorating Law Week. Adopted this 23rd day of April 2013 and signed by all five members of the Board of County Commissioners. Mr. Kessner. Good morning. Yes, uh, 
you, uh, the proclamation did an excellent job of, uh, of laying out the theme for this year's Law Week. Um, we have two chief events that are going to affect the community at large. Number one, we have um, attorneys going to, I believe, every single school in the county, um, elementary school, middle school, and high school, doing um, grade level appropriate uh, lessons with the students. Um, I, I myself am going to a middle school and an elementary school where we, we will be talking about equal protection under the law, um, constitutional issues if the, if the grade level you know, uh, finds that appropriate, and, um, and working with the teachers in our schools here to, to have a discussion with the children. Um, we've done this in years past uh, with various themes. It's always, um, I think it's rewarding. It's, the, the children are more interested than, than one would expect maybe. Uh, and I think the lawyers always um, walk away, you know, feeling uh, reinvigorated about some of the things that they have going on in their careers, um, and being able to share that with the with the local children in the schools. Um, and in addition to that, we're also going to have a Ask a Lawyer event at the courthouse on Thursday um, ne of next week, um, May second, where um, any member of the community that has a legal issue. Um, that they're not sure about, they would like to ask some questions about or get some guidance on, um, we'll have the opportunity to sit down with a, an attorney and, um, and have those questions a answered. Um, we we uh, are joined by Florida Rural Legal <laughs> Services in administering that day, um, and, uh, and we'll provide answers for any member of the community that, um, that would like those uh, answered um, between 9 and 4 next Thursday, May 2nd at the Indian River County Courthouse. Which room? We're going to be in the the law library space okay. there. Right. We'll, be, we'll be there, on the, which is on the first floor. Anybody who's unsure, first floor, bear to the right. Um, we'll be there um, with attorneys and staff from Florida Rural Legal Services. Okay. Well, thank you very much for your work and the work at the local bar to educate our citizens and our students. And I hope you have a great law week. Thank you and very much. And please come on up and get thank the proclamation. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes for the regular meeting of March 19, 2013. Move to approve. Motion by Commissioner Davis, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. There are no informational items. The uh, consent agenda, gentlemen? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Davis, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries 4-0 unanimously. Uh, the next item is the, in the constitutional offices and governmental agencies is the Indian River County property appraiser, David C. Nolte, uh, regarding computer equipment. The letter dated April 15, 2013, found on pages 112 through 117. Good morning, Mr. Nolte. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, <clears throat> I'm here because we, I had a misunderstanding. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, we entered into a contract to uh, get some new computer software. Our current software was installed in 1990. And uh, I was under the impression um, that you guys were picking up the tab for it. Turns out that was not the right impression, that you were only going to pay the first $100,000 of it. Um, you know, sometimes in life, people are talking and you hear what you want to hear and the other guy is saying what he wants to say, and it's not always the same thing. So I do apologize to you for this situation. Um, we need to increase our budget by the $100,000 to be able to make the second installment on the $600,000 total purchase price. So I'm here today to ask uh, for your non-objection to me raising my budget. I'll just note that we're not paying for it either. It's the taxpayers. And noting that, I'll move approval of this request. Second. Gentlemen, any further discussion? Just real quick. I'm assuming that then it will be in your next year's budget. Absolutely. Okay. And that will be four more years and then it will finally be paid off? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Anything further? 
Motion on the floor by Commissioner Solari, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, 4 to 0. Thank you ever so much, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Nolte. Appreciate everything you do. Next item uh, on the uh, public items is a public discussion, a request to speak from Reverend William Shelley on community concerns regarding recent shootings in Gifford, found on pages 118. Good morning, Reverend Shelley. Good morning, how are you doing? Good, good to see you. Good to be here. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. And everyone on this staff of this Indian River County. I find myself in this, this little position of coming forward to this commission not by choice, but I have been compelled to come here and speak on some of the issues surrounding the shootings that have been going on in Gifford now for the past, some people look back of maybe three weeks or a month, but I can look back eight years. And in this particular area of this county, consisting of about four blocks. There has been numerous shootings and incidents of shootings. And this particular shooting sent out a message loud and clear throughout our community. Because there were several guns pulled and there were several shots fired. And I live approximately 300 feet. Just let me give you my address. My address is 4630 32nd Avenue, about 300 feet from that corner where the shooting occurred, this, this last big shooting. And as I looked out my window when the shooting started, I was sitting down watching a basketball game. And the shooting began. And my daughter ran, my 16-year-old daughter ran to my room, and she said, Daddy, Daddy, what's happening? I said, sit down. And I looked out the window, and I saw people running, scaring for their lives as the rounds continued to be fired. I want to remind you, there has been reports that there were 49 shells picked up off the ground, or more. An indication that there was at least 49 rounds fired. And so at that point, something on the inside of me compelled me to be here. Not just for me. Not just for my two daughters and my grandson who lives in the house with me was for every innocent person that could have been a victim of one of those rounds. And as you all know, there were some innocent victims. And I thought back on how could this happen? How? Not only how, but why? And I had to go back. And I had to rewind my thinking. Like I said, I moved and I built my house on 32nd Avenue. And I chose to build my house in that area. It was by choice. I could have built anywhere else in any River County. But I chose that area simply because it was one of the most depressed areas in my mind in the county. And I saw an opportunity for me to be just a little beacon of hope for the people in that area. So I chose, with my wife's consent, to build my house there. And as I talk to people going up and down the street, they want a better life. They want peace. They want happiness. They want joy. <clears throat> But these activities I'm here to tell you are forced on them. 
There are some that benefit from these types of activities. So they're inclined for these things to continue. But I'm here to dec decline those types of activities in our community. I'm not speaking for no group. I'm not speaking for no organization. I'm simply speaking as a taxpaying citizen of Indian River County. And I've had so many things that I've experienced since I was brought here from Mississippi, a little old town called Caledonia, Mississippi, right outside of Columbus by my parents, who was seeking a better life for her 13 children. 13 of us. And they all grew up working for the citrus industry. I see the Henry River County logo, citrus. My mother, my father, my brothers, all worked for great citrus owners in this community. Mr. Victor Knight, Mr. Harold Knight, Mr. Dick Hatfield, Mr. Robert Graves, all these people I've met personally. I've even ate breakfast. He might not remember because it's been so long ago when I was a little boy at Mr. Ralph Sexton's house out on his farm. Good people. But somehow it seemed like the goodness have been tarnished because we now find ourselves surrounded by bad things happening constantly in our community. And I no longer can sit down and let the people who are allowing these things to happen continue to do the same thing over and over again. So I'm coming to this commission asking for you all to get involved, to come up with a plan of action to revitalize this depressed area. You can go down the streets beginning at 30th Avenue all the way down to 34th Court and you can find pockets of depression. There are resources that this county have at their hand that they can bring to bear to kind of alleviate some of these conditions. The shootings is really the result of not really going after the source. And the source is we've become tolerant of activities that causes us <coughs> to be put in this predicament. And I know there's been at least 12 or 13, maybe 14 articles written since the shooting concerning the shootings and the happenings in Gifford. And as I was reading I read every one of them. I take my time and I go through the comments that some people made and I looked over the wordings that was used. And one of them that stood out to me was Gifford is safe. It's safe to walk your child down the street in Gifford. It's safe to do outdoor activities in Gifford. And me living on 32nd Avenue, where majority of these things culminate from, these evening parties, these evening gatherings, at night, while I'm sleeping in my bed, I hear shots. Shots fired. I get on the phone. I call. I say, shots being fired. I had gotten to the point where it didn't even bother me anymore to hear shots being fired. If I might sound a little angry, I am. 
No one should have to live. Like I said, I chose to live there. But I didn't choose to live under these conditions. I read this one little article from these three little old ladies. And these three little ladies made it very clear that I was not the only one experiencing these types of feelings. The comments they made was, I just want to read a little excerpt from it. I had to get to the ground, said Miss Brown, who used to run a service station near where the April 10th shooting happened along 45th Street, in which a teenager was charged with firing at someone just east of 40th Avenue. Gunfire erupted but didn't injure anyone. And when I read that, I said, now she's 82 years old. And she's getting down on the ground, ducking from the sounds of gunfire. Seniors. And I read on where it says 2,700 people in our community are age 65 and older, according to the 2010 census. And most of the time when I hear people talk about these gatherings, they talk about the young people needing somewhere to go, needing something to do. But very seldom do I hear about the older people. On my street, there are business people, retired business people, people that have businesses that they're right now involved in. 80, 90 years old, they're experiencing the same thing I'm experiencing. From these gatherings, I'm, I, I, I can be here all day, but I don't want to spend too much of your time. I have three bags of trash on the back of my truck out in the parking lot that I collected from the corner of 32nd Avenue where I live down to the corner of 46th Street, which is about one block and only on the, primarily one side of the street. Four garbage bags of trash. I went out a week later and collected off the street. It's on the back of my truck right now. I brought it down in case you don't believe what I'm saying. It shouldn't be. And I know people have the right to use their property for whatever purpose they feel like they can use it, as long as it's within the law on their property. But once it spills out into county property and into our streets, it's no longer just their concern. It's our concern. And I just know that my tax dollars come to any River County. And literally, the buck stops here. The buck stops here. You are our elected officials, overseers of the welfare and the safety of the citizens of this county. My safety is no less important than any one of y'all's safety sitting here. When my 16-year-old daughter runs to me and tells me, Daddy, Daddy, what's going on? When 49 rounds are being fired, it hurts. I'm not Superman. I can't go out there and get in front of no bullet and it'll bounce off. 
But sometimes you have to be willing to die to stand up for what is right. I'm a veteran of the United States Army. Served in combat zone. Honorably discharged. Traveled three quarters of the way around the world. Served this country proudly. Now it's time for this country to serve the citizens of this county. Let's stop the name calling, the finger pointing. There are hard working people in Gifford, family oriented people in Gifford. People that have so much pride in their community. But it seems like we're on an island all alone. We're not separated from Indian River County. Gifford is not separate. Gifford is not an entity that sits all by itself and, 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 and has the responsibility of taking care of itself. It's the responsibility of every, every citizen in Indian River County for us to take care of one another. And I don't see that's happening. And I'm here to plead to you all to get involved. Get all of the elected entities in this county involved in trying to help remedy some of the problems that we are experiencing. And for the life of me, I don't understand how some people that take and put themselves in a position to speak for everybody. I don't understand that. But I have a voice. I can speak for myself. And I choose to do so. Because I really don't need no one else to speak for me. If I needed someone to speak for me, I would politely go to them and tell them to please speak for me. <clears throat> but I don't need that. I don't need that. And I'm just asking this commission to please take a look at these problems. help us to come up with some solutions. I've heard in the last nine years, I've heard maybe 3,000 solutions to these problems. But guess what? None of them solve the problem. We need somebody with some professional knowledge. Our community development directors our public works directors to come in and look and see what kind of things need to be done to revitalize this area, to improve this area so that people can have pride, have a sense of concern and, 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 and caring about where they live. They need that. We need that. It's not a black and white issue, it's a wrong and right issue. I have just as many friends that are from different nationalities than, than anybody sitting on this board. We can do better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Ms. Shelley, you, you, you might want to stay, stay by the podium. Uh, I appreciate your, your well thought out words of, of sincerity. Um, Commissioner Davis, you want to say yeah, something? Yeah, just real quick. The, um, when you moved there, uh, but <clears throat> what is it that has changed? What is it that has brought it to a fever pitch in the past 30 days, it seems like? So I, I see it. I understand what you're talking about. 
I, I really can't put my finger on what law enforcement's doing different, what we're doing different, that has caused it to get to this point. What I see as I travel down 32nd, I live there every day. Every day. What I see is that we have become more tolerant of more uh, of things that are not according to the law. We've taken the law and we've bent it to our favor. Whether that be county ordinances, whether that be Florida statutes, we've bent the law to the point that it seemed like it broke. And that, in, that, that, that includes consumption of alcohol, that includes gatherings and traveling up and down the street. When they, when they have these gatherings on this corner, which by ordinances is not really a legal activity, there's consumption of alcohol, there's music blasting to the highest pitch cars speeding up and down the street. You can't even get through the street. Safety issue. Public safety. And this stuff has been tolerated. It kept increasing until it got to this point where you had people from all over South Florida okay. gathering up. I've had people to tell me that they've estimated over 2,000. Wow. But I know the newspaper printed 500 on that particular corner. Is this an organized event, or is it just something that's... It's not organized. It, it's total, total, total chaos. Uh, Mr. Shelley and uh, Commissioner Davis, I uh, have had the experience to uh, be about that area. Mm -hmm. uh, Sheriff Laura is here, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Teddy, uh, Teddy Floyd is here as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you, as you may recall, I used to work with the company. And the... The type of event that you're suggesting mm -hmm. is not an unorganized event. It is probably well organized. Well, it is chaotic, but well organized. Oh, okay. In other words, it, it has all the earmarks of a, a responsive r rave, and it is suggested throughout a community that uh, admires cars, uh, that, that has all these unique type of cars that we're going to meet at this location at this time and it, it is a huge swarm of individuals all for the same common cause and that is to admire the cause and it is an organized social event. It is not a registered social event, it is not a permitted social event yeah. and it does get into a chaotic sense mm -hmm. from it, it, I, I think law enforcement and, and the citizens see 100 or 200 people within the hour of 9 and 9.05 miraculously appear. So I have to say that it is a, an, uh, an unauthorized but well-organized yeah. event yeah. Yeah. that goes into chaos when yeah. 8 and 900, it's, it's almost akin to when yeah. mom and dad aren't in the home and they go on vacation, and one kid goes to school and said, I think we're going to have a party. And we all know how that goes, where we have about 150 people inside of a home that was designed for eight. And that's when it becomes a law enforcement nightmare. And I think that these vehicular raves that have occurred, I think the sheriff is... Uh, moving very swiftly to address them, but I, I do agree with you, over the years these events were considered, well, they're doing something positive, but now it has spawned into gunfire, and it's not going to be tolerated. And I understand that law enforcement is doing many tried and, and, tried and proven strategies to create that interference. I know we have two, uh, speaking to the business owners and uh, having signs put up this week uh, and a, a bus stop put up this week, I know that that does not may, may not sound like well we've cured 
The problem, no, we have not. But it takes the community, it takes government, it takes law enforcement, support of your law enforcement to be able to accomplish this goal. It requires uh, a specialized element of law enforcement. Uh, this is, uh, I don't want to coin it all as gang type uh, uh, activity, but okay. there is an element where people do not have the home life, they've created a home life within these raves. And they, they're not going to be tolerated. And we have it on good authority that the sheriff is going to continue his vigilant effort in order to create the static interference to eliminate these type of situations. As we said underneath the tent at the gathering, there are good people in Gifford. There are great people in Gifford. There are also good people and great people in Fort Pierce. What we're talking about is the small percentage that have found a spot here in Gifford to call their playground. Well, and we're not going to have that playground here. Can, can I just say something? And I didn't want to open nope. up this can, but, but since you opened it up, um, I understand your position, Commissioner Fletcher. This is your district, part of your district. And very concerned. District 2. And, and I understand your position. You know, I, I, I understand politics. I understand politics very well. But I'm talking about bullets flying by my house. If there's justification for that, I would like to see it in writing. No, there is none. And nobody wants and, to see and your there, children ducking bullets. I understand. I understand. That's what I'm here about. Absolutely. And, and the gathering is just the, 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 the stage... You see, somebody has to set the stage. You know, we, 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 ne we, never, we never committed the act. We never committed the act of firing the guns. But we helped set the stage. We had put the scene in place. So we're guilty. We don't want to take no responsibility or accountability. But there's enough blame to go around this room a hundred times, including myself including myself, for not speaking out before now. There's enough blame you can lay at everybody's door for what occurred. But it does not negate the fact that three people were shot, a little baby was injured, and 49 rounds were fired, not from the same weapon. I heard with my own ears at least, in my estimation, six different calibers of weapons. My estimation. My little knowledge about firearms. Being an expert in the military with firearms. They I estimate at least six different calibers of weapons being fired. That was, to me, really a comparison to being in a war zone. When you gotta hit the floor, low crawl, those combat maneuvers, that's what I felt like. And to talk about how nice it was and how, I think we're missing the point. The point is not how it started, but how it ended. How it ended. We must be we must be we must be wiser. We must be smarter in how we do things. It's well reported that there are gangs all around South Florida. Well reported. Well documented. Open invitation. Come on. Cars, pretty cars, that's real nice. But in my estimation, it is very misleading and misguiding to have young people to get so caught up 
into pretty cars, pretty rims, pretty paint jobs. Well, agreed. There needs to be some education on economics. Not just wasting resources. So I'm not here to, to lay no blame at nobody's feet and to say why this happened. All I'm asking is that this county commission help us to try and make sure it never happened again. That's why I'm here. That's the only reason I'm here. I don't want to have to tell my young daughter to sit down when bullets are flying because you don't know when, where they're going to come through your window or not. But I stood in my window. One could have hit me. But at that time, it didn't really matter. Because I wanted to see for myself what was going on. And what I saw was people running for their lives, literally running for their lives, screaming and yelling and hollering. Yeah, that's what I saw. It's etched in my memory forever. On the block I live on, this is what I saw. Shouldn't be. Especially in a county such as Indian River County. Shouldn't be. We can do better. Any more questions? Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Gentlemen? Thank you. We appreciate your words, uh, Mr. Shelley, and uh, we do share those concerns. And uh, I'm uh, eager to see solutions as well, to work solutions, and uh, have uh, been in communication with the Pats Association, uh, been in, in, in communication with Teddy um, at, at the location, uh, looking at different strategies, looking at the uh, old SEPTED philosophies that we both shared in, in years of uh, law enforcement, uh, communicated with the sheriff, and, and I know that the sheriff is working diligently. The sheriff is here. Uh, sheriff, I don't want to speak as a, as, as a, as a third party. You've been so active in, in addressing. Uh, you have been to all the community meetings. We've shared the same time together. Uh, we, we are looking for answers. And uh, we, uh, we know that you're working very diligently to neutralize these ill effects. Unfortunately, when we do have gatherings, unfortunately, the, the world order today is once there is a gathering, there is an alert. Fifteen years ago, when there was a gathering, these vehicle gatherings were nothing more than admiring rims and, and sound boxes and maybe a little bit of public annoyance that was addressed by one or two deputies. That's no longer the case. And uh, I, I know that the sheriff is working hard. I don't know if you want to show all the cards, but I know the sheriff is working to neutralize all of these deleterious yep. efforts uh, that others are creating for us to have to be concerned with. Sheriff. You're right. Thank you, Chairman. We certainly have addressed this issue on, on many different occasions, many different uh, community <laughs> workshops, many different groups. Uh, I've spoken uh, specifically uh, with Reverend Shelley. Uh, in particular with the angle of having more involvement from the different county and entities. We've looked at a uh, three-prong approach that includes obviously law enforcement, uh, the theological or the spiritual side of, of the entire county, as well as the, the community leaders. And uh, I believe that's what Mr. Shelley's mission was today, was to employ all of us to work together. Uh, obviously we've had some very strategic law enforcement plans uh, prior to uh, the Easter event as well as to continue on. So we've made significant progress. Uh, have we offended a few people? Absolutely. Uh, but are we continuing on with our zero tolerance throughout the entire county? Yes, we are. Have we made dozens of arrests? Yes, we have. Uh, so we will continue that. That's our mission, to keep the county safe from that angle. Uh, and as Mr. Shelley mentioned, we do um, plea for the community outreach. Uh, we plea for victims to come forward. We plea for witnesses to come forward. Uh, and we plead for our, our elected and our community officials to come forward and help solve this problem. 
Sheriff, is there anything you need from us that you don't already have? We, we need con obviously continued support. Um, you have it. Yeah, and I, and I recognize that. We do, uh, and we will continue to work. I think some of the issues also uh, revolve around uh, improving the conditions in the Gifford community. I hear a lot of uh, suggestions about improving 45th Street uh, and, and how enhancing some of the aesthetics uh, and essentially changing the mindset of the Gifford community. There are several examples. I think a young lady spoke last Tuesday, Ms. Althea McKenzie, and I know Commissioner Davis, you're well aware of, of, the, uh, of the Gifford plan and you're working forward with that. And that's something, to be quite frank, that hasn't been worked on in, uh, in several years. I didn't even know it existed. Right. Um, and that's, that's one indicator that we certainly have um, a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do to incorporate the Enterprise Zone uh, and the others. Uh, with respect to your question, obviously on May 1st we have a budget to submit, so we uh, will certainly be entertaining some things with that. So, and I'll answer any of your questions. Thank you for your time and thank you for your support, Commissioner Fletcher. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Gentlemen, anything further? One other. Yeah. <clears throat> Please. I'm Cynthia Spann and I live at the address at 45. 75 33rd Avenue. I am caught up in the same situation that Reverend Shelley is caught up in. We live a street over from each other, and I'm tired of it. We need help desperately. Uh, these activities that are taking place, you consider it's okay. In my book, it's not okay because it's dangerous. I'm already living in danger and this draws the crowd a little more. And it's wrong that I have to live in my home, that I've been there for 52 years. I was born and raised there. And I never, ever had to sit down in my home and listen to all the filth that comes out of these cars about people pirating private parts. All the cursing that's going on. And I can't get no one to help me to stop this. If it take a person to uh, be able to not buy uh, uh, such things uh, from a store, you have to be 18 years old to buy it. Why is it scandalized in the open? It's wrong. My grandson, seven years old, comes to me and Ma, uh, they cussing over there. This music is like sitting inside of my home. I have to listen to this every day, all night. I've spoken to people to try to help me with this. I don't get anything from them, nothing. I'm here to ask you all to try to get with somebody to help me get this, this problem solved. Is this happening on vacant land near you? Is it happening in the middle of the street? Vacant land, when they're having these things riding around the place, holding up driveways, parking in my, 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 my driveway, I can't get no one to put even signs out. And the neighborhood. I'm not just putting it on the activity. It's the neighborhood. Is, is is, is this something that do you, do you feel like on this vacant land that they actually have the permission of the property owner to be on? Say that again. Do you think where this is happening on the vacant lots? Do you think that... Right across the street in front of my house. It's a vacant lot. It's a vacant lot. I've been begging for them to put signs there. Do, do you feel like that they have the permission of the property owner to be there? Do they... Do I feel like they need... Yeah, I mean, do, is, it, does somebody have permission to be on that, or are they just basically, because it's a vacant lot, uh, gathering on that lot? Both ways. However you want to take it. They, they come down. No. They even took over our yards. Ms. Spam, can, can you give me the, the uh, general address or the, the cross streets? Uh, no, I don't know the, the exact address because that lot... It's right beside the school. It's a school there. Okay. It's a preschool there. And they use this vacant lot for the, their parking lot. And is that where, Mr. Shelley, is that where you're talking about the garbage always is? No, the garbage no, is around the whole neighborhood. His block, my block. 
I found condoms in the yard on the same day. And I had just gotten my yard mowed the day before this incident of all the shooting. This is ridiculous. It's nasty. It hurts me. Gifford is like history to me. Mm-hmm. Majority of those houses on that street and a lot of more in there. My relatives built those houses. These business, a lot of those business in Gifford, they are my relatives. And the place is going down. There's nobody trying to help us. Nobody. It hurts to see that hard work go to waste because somebody want to have a good time on our expense. It's wrong. It's not right. I really don't see why it's got to be that many people coming here to show off a car. I've seen V. Roche do car shows. If people don't act a fool like this, when they do the car show, it's over with. See, that's what I'm concerned about with some unintended consequences here. Um, and, and I'll give you an example. You being a lifelong resident there like you're talking, you remember the days whenever somebody would grow something in their backyard like some collards or some kind of a pro- Yes, I remember. All, and it hurting me to my heart to hear that they can't sell it on the side right. of the road. And it hurt it, me. It does me too. And, and, and it's the and unintended. And it took away from the older ones because they are the ones that they die. Well, not only that. It, they don't have. It took, you know, people that everybody knew in the community off the side of the road. Now nobody's there. And I understand. We, and that's, that's what I don't yes. have happen here. Yes. Now. I don't want to go up there and try to regulate the community out of having, you know, young, life. homegrown Gifford boys and girls show off their cars. I know they no. take, I, I take, you know, yeah. pride and took my, more so when I was growing up than right. I in my truck that's always right. dirty now. But the, um, so I don't want to regulate them out, out of that. No, I don't want, I want them to have fun. So you how do we, how, how, do, how do I help you? With that, I mean, we could send code enforcement up there right now, and if there's garbage somewhere, I'm sure we could cite them. Uh, we, if they're there, and when we do that, then the the owner's going to probably give us a call and say, "Well, nobody's supposed to be on that." And then we're going to say, "Well, you need to put something up around that to keep people from getting on your on your lot, then, or something like that." And I, I don't, I don't. Something I, I've been trying to get the, the sheriff office to, to cooperate with us. Well, I don't know that, that the, the sheriff, the can. sheriff is reacting. We, if, it, if there's some code issues up there, that may be something that we can do. But I'm, I'm really concerned about the unintended consequences of what this could have on yes. the different community if we if if we try to take a one size fits all approach to it. Well, I'm not trying to stop the kids from having their fun, but it's 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 the respect about everything. Hmm. It's respect. And right now, I am not having no respect at all. None. I'll drive up there today. I'm not, I'll try to get my mind wrapped more around exactly what specifically you're dealing with. I have, I have, no, we have had problems from shooting from the preschool property, the property I'm talking about, over to the apartment. The apartment shooting back over to the school. And parents are picking their kids up. This is ridiculous. The school is in. All you can hear is about body parts. You doing this to me and you doing It's... Really. It's like there's no more respect in, in, in Gifford at all. None. It's like nobody raised them. I'm constantly out there. I take risks. I take it. Because I love those kids and I want to see them react to our history, I call it our history, better than what they're doing. It don't make sense. It do not make sense for us to keep tolerating all of these things that's going on as if we don't see it or hear it. I can't even let my grandson come out and play in his own yard. I have to crank up every time he needs to go and, and, and play to a park somewhere. Unfortunately, to some 
some uh, respect that, and you mentioned the word respect, we'll visit that in a, in a moment. Uh, that is happening across America. I'm speaking about my is, neighborhood now, though. It is magnified we, right here in Gifford. Yeah, we, and we, we, as our county, this is our county. I'm not talking about the America. I'm talking about right here where we need to fix these problems. And, and, I, and I, I see what you're talking about. I've been in, in Gifford since the shootings no less than a dozen times, uh, talking with Teddy, walking and, and looking at uh, different aspects that can be improved. Uh, there, there might be some elements that we can improve as far as infrastructure, but that big word that we're talking about, respect. That's right, respect. They, I don't know if government can work that into, excuse me? So you can't, you can't legislate respect? You, you can't let, yes, you, you can't legislate respect. Respect has to come from within the family workings, within the spiritual workings at the pulpit, and within, and within the, the community. I was just going to say that, and, and the community. And we want to support that. Yeah. Uh, we want to look at infrastructure to see if there's something that we can create a barrier, a resistance element for the criminal activities to take place, for quality of life to be maintained. But as Commissioner Davis said, it, how far do you want it to go where this uh, broad scale approach now reduces the likelihood okay. of any of the, the great positive things that are happening, like, like people fishing in the canals for spec. Uh, you know, I, I just get a, a warmth in my heart when I see Someone fishing in the canals. Okay. And okay. And and selling greens. Okay. Uh, yes, yes. I, I agree. Yeah. And when the strawberries and the watermelons. Yeah. That is the part of the fabric of Gifford. That is the culture of Gifford. Let's not interfere with that. Let's just get this ugliness out. And the ugliness has to be, as the sheriff said, a several prong approach. It is law enforcement. It is government. It is the community. And we are actively looking at ways to improve that environment to create a, a, a fertile infrastructure. But we need the support of the people of the community. Right. I think we have exactly. it. I think that, you know, I saw that in, in just in the gathering, the impromptu gathering that was, it was well organized and it was permitted to, to see that the community came together. You know, first blush, it was about 100 people. Then it became 200 people, and on that night it, it just enveloped. And by the third day, there were several hundred people talking about it, several hundred people in the building, under the tent. And now the community is sparked for positive uh, response. I think that's what we need to have more so, because this challenge didn't happen in 30 seconds. Maybe the gunfire happened in, in, in less than five minutes. Right. But the challenge did not happen within five right. minutes. And it's going to take a little bit of time to address all of the concerns to create the barriers so it does not happen again. No one wants to see gunfire in the community. No one wants to see gunfire approaching your house or anyone else's. I don't want to hear uh, Mr. Shelley having to uh, revert back to his military experience and having to uh, identify right. the level of threat that what he felt what gunfire right. was, whether it was a 45 or a 22 or a 32, which I know he is well qualified, right. and I know Mr. Shelley a number of years. Uh, but to, to have to identify that, that is tragic in itself the same way as many of the situations that are happening throughout communities in America that we have to address. We have to create the environment, but we need the citizens' cooperation, acceptance, and embracement for the limitations that might be imposed, the same way as air travel. Obviously, a marathon is never going to be the same. Obviously, when we have the Olympics, they're never going to be the same. There are limitations, and we as citizens have to look at the constraints that we have to uh, endure to, in order to accomplish that safety that we were looking at, that quality of life that we were looking at, that when we look back at 50 years ago, what a different and wonderful world this truly was, 
that it still is a wonderful world, but there are many obstacles to overcome to get to that quality of life that you want and duly deserve. And I am open for all suggestions. Uh, I know this, this commission is uh, actively looking at and have been in the community and uh, uh, want, wanting to hear from the community as to what can be done. I want to know what we can do. Uh, you know, we, we said it earlier, I, I, I know it's, it might sound, um, uh, I don't know, just very limited, but we say, well, we put signs up and the bus stop just went up and we're speaking to the business owners. But all of this is parts of the whole. And when, uh, when we've walked through the community, we could see evidence that, yes, there is signs of deterioration. Yes. But some of it uh, can be addressed by infrastructure. Some of it has to be addressed by that other word we were talking about, respect. That's right. And that has to come from the youth towards our seniors. Right. And I think that's what Mr. Shelley wants to see, and I think that's what everybody in, in, in New River County, uh, and not just Gifford, wants to see. And we'll work hard to get that. And we need full cooperation with all parts of the element. It, it, it stems at the school board, it stems at this commission, it stems at the sheriff's office, and all of the fine men and women who serve in this community as role models and leaders in the community. Yes, and one, one more thing I would like to ask. Um, when they're having these events, there needs to be a uh, sheriff down the street, and not only on 45th. They need to have some, some uh, deputies there because uh, there's a lot of disrespect going on during that time. The music is too loud for one and for what is it. They are playing for two, all the activities with the drinking and stuff going on, three. And I have witnessed that there was wrecks going on during the time of that shooting. I've witnessed that I'm looking at the fire coming from the gun itself. I was just picking up my grandson out of a car. Someone was trying to bring my grandson home, and he couldn't get to me. It was so many cars sitting in one spot forever. So he had to call me to come get him out of the car before I can get him to do good. What do I see? Fire, shoot, everywhere. So if I could get someone to chaperone this down in my area while this activity going on, there are some time I be wanting to leave my house and I can't leave. Well, we don't, we don't want that to happen, and we don't want you to have that feeling. That's that quality of life feeling that I want reinstilled. And in talking with the sheriff uh, and, and talking with some of the citizens in the community, uh, you know, I heard a comment that someone said, well, you can't tell who's a deputy anymore. You know what? That's a good thing. You need to know your deputies. Probably one of the most popular deputies in, in uh, Gifford is standing behind you, uh, Teddy Floyd. And uh, I, I think uh, every, everybody in the Gifford community knows Teddy Floyd. Yeah, and the rest of and, come and, and many of the evening. deputies that serve yeah. you in uniform with their badge and everything that they need to be properly identified. Uh, there, there are, I don't want to turn all the sheriff's cards, but... I want you to know that I don't believe that you can identify all the deputies that are in your community. No, I can't. And, and I think that uh, there's good reason for that, that you have been able to uh, been afford, since unfortunately, since the unfortunate incident, that you have had an element of security that you had not had in the past. Unfortunately, that has to happen, and that's the sheriff is applying different strategies. And uh, you, may, you may be looking at one of those vehicles with the big chrome wheels, and that may not be someone that's creating ill will from Fort Pierce or somebody in the local area. That might just be a deputy that's trying to work the situation and create that element of safety and security that you deserve and will have. And we do have the commitment from the sheriff that he is applying all of his strategies and resources. And I think you just heard that, uh, well, we're coming around budget time. So I guess we're going to be hearing a little bit more about the sheriff's strategies and resources that are going to be needed so that you won't be at the podium 
You'll be just sitting out in that chair that you want to be sitting out and enjoying the quality of life that you deserve and will have. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Shell, you're back. Yeah, you summed it up. You summed it up. I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I, I was going to address the issue that you was talking about, but you summed it up well. I don't have anything. Did I cover it? Yeah, you, you got it. Thank you, Mr. Shelley, and thank you for your re uh, request to speak today. Um, as we've said, conversation, communication is going to build a quicker bridge than what can be provided by over law enforcement and strong community control that might alter the quality of life that you're, you're seeking. And we'll continue. Appreciate Thank you, Mr. Shelley. Thank you. Next on the agenda, uh, Council, if you're uh, uh, do the honors on the public notice item. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have one public notice item. It's notice of a scheduled public hearing from May 7, 2013 to consider an ordinance of the Board of County Commissioners of Indian, Indian River County, Florida, adding Part 3, Section 312.21 of the Code of Indian River County, requiring a franchise to construct, operate, and maintain natural gas facilities over, under, or upon the public rights-of-way of Indian River County. That's a legislative matter. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, next item on the agenda is uh, item 12G, which is uh, from the Office of Management and Budget, the quarterly budget report, memorandum dated April 17, 2013, found on pages 120 through 131. Good morning, Mr. Brown. Thank you, Commissioner Flesher. Uh, for the record, uh, Jason Brown, County Budget Director. Good morning, Commissioners. Have a brief um, quarterly budget report, as, as we do each quarter for you here. Um, and, and like I said, this is the dashboard here. Um, kind of, kind of goes along with, uh, sums up the monthly reports that we do, uh, and on a quarterly basis we provide this. In addition to the the rest of the reports in your backup, um, just want to hit kind of some of the high points. Um, not spend too much time. W one of the things we focus on is, is uh, you know, we set up the budget and we and we know what we're expecting each year and kind of what you track um, throughout the year are those variances, the things that aren't what you expected. And, and, uh, and, uh, and that, that kind of tells you where you're going to have a, a, a deviation or a variation from the budget. So what we look at is, uh, is one of the things is, is the major revenues. Uh, so I'll just start with that. A half cent sales tax, we are seeing some, some strength here. Uh, it's up modestly, about 4.9% from the previous year, and uh, running a, uh, about 3.5% over the budget. Um, that is helpful for the general fund and the uh, MSTU fund. Optional sales tax is up 5.6% uh, uh, from the prior year. Uh, we, we budgeted that conservatively, uh, so, so it's significantly over the budget at March 31st. I will point out that since March 31st, we have amended the budget to fund uh, both the sheriff's vehicles and, and an ambulance from that source, so uh, that, that budget will be revised upward shortly, so, uh, so uh, we won't, uh, won't have that excess over the budget after adjusting for that, Mr. Chairman, for those purchases. Yes, Commissioner Davis. Now, how is it that the half cent sales tax is up at, to that and the optional sales tax is? I mean, help me with that discrepancy. It, it's always a bit of a mystery. I will say there are some differences. The, se the optional tax is the seventh cent that we levy that we use for infrastructure. It is only charged on the first $5,000 of a purchase. Uh, mm -hmm. So if somebody purchases a vehicle, a boat, you know, something large over $5,000, um, that one cent is not paid on all of it. But that's going in the wrong direction for what I see. I mean, it, 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 you would think then that the half cent sales tax would be higher and that would explain people are buying larger ticket items. Right. G generally, that would that would point to the to the uh, larger ticket items uh, being being purchased more. Um, the the other part of it is it just goes to the Department of Revenue, and we get uh, what we get back is is a black box. They say, "Here's your check for the for the month," and and there it is. They they do the the collecting and redistributing. Um, we also are share we do share those uh, those revenues with. 
uh, municipalities, um, and, and sometimes the the, the but, distribution. But a percentage is a percentage. I I hear you. Well, All right, they, Commissioner they, Schwartz, No, no. The formula, the formula changes though based on that population. That wasn't with expertise. It's it two, the formula changes based on variables. So the formula changes every year. So not mm -hmm. only is there the growth, if you had more, if you had more population growth in the unincorporated area and the city went down, that can cause that. So, so I, but I get what you're saying. Aren't it's I correct, Jason? Almost yes. like you know the the, the minor so, minor taxation of, should be higher. City of Vero Beach's population went down, right? And so did, but ours went up considerably more. So that makes that higher. On the half cent or the optional? optional. And the half cent actually. Well, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, if we could explain what the state. I did, get you. I mean, well, we can explain what yeah. they're going to do on Medicaid today. We'd be lucky. <laughs> Commissioner Davis? Know. Yes, sir. I, I think Joe's blaming it on the state. I think it's the state and the county and the federal. Yeah. It's called government accounting. And I'm not okay. going to be able to help you. All right. So understand. Dude, there, there's always been a slight difference there. Um, the only thing I can think of is, is those large, per, large purchases. Um, so you don't have even collection. Commissioner oh, Zork, I agree with you, Commissioner Davis. The relationship yeah. with the percentage, percentages are not the way you'd think that you Yeah, not, they do not correlate. We, yeah, we yes. agree with that. We, agree. we totally agree. Yeah. Okay. We agree. We've, we've we just can't. come to accept it over the years. That All right. Oh, I also, um, uh, in, in Tallahassee a couple of weeks ago, they had somebody from Department of Revenue that was that was there. And as you've heard me mention in the past, the the question of so much out-of-town activity going on, and I, I posed the question to them, how... How much can we look into these out-of-town operators? Are they paying their purport their share of what they should be paying here? And I, I said, so why you know can can we go as far as looking at their submittal of tax receipts or, or something? And and she said there has been some change where it's a little bit broader that we can look or I don't want to say spot check, but um, I'll get with Jason and the the lady from Department of Revenue that did the program up there and and. I just. I think if you look at one, you, I just you put remember a what was explained one. to me. Well, I, I remember what I, when I called the state. What was explained to me? A lot of your people are buying the high-priced vehicles out of your county, which drives the optional sales tax up considerably because they transfer it back in. Every car dealership accounts for it. You go to a furniture store; they don't necessarily boats, RVs, cars. Because the tag registration. Because the tag it. registration right. triggers it. Right. Yeah. That is and, I, and and I'm looking at more of I got from the state the the out of town contractor activity. We we have had a very robust increase in building permits side, but if you look at that, probably 85 percent of that activity is from national builders whose regions are managed out of Orlando or Brevard. <laughs> and when you go to a job site, you you don't find an Indian River County subcontractor on the job. So. All the deliveries are coming from out of town. Um, so just uh, just some way we can spot check that industry. I know when the building side, when we had to do our, our Department of Revenue contributions and sending it in, what we went through, and it, it really would just be nice just to make sure we have a comfort level that, okay, they're all from out of town, but they're all paying their fair share according to our tax structure. So I'll we get can, we can reduce the concern with bringing, bringing back the, uh, the local contractor uh, advantage as well. Oh, well, and these are all private, so it wouldn't really make a difference. Could, could, could I just ask the commission just real quick? I would, I'd like to give staff some direction here to just to make sure that these um, correlations between the two, because Joe, just what you just said, do, do you charge the half cent sales tax on anything above five thousand dollars? It's on everything. It's a portion of the six cents that the state that, collects. Joe, what you just said rate. still going in the wrong direction for the but ratios that we they, have here. They tend to remit the the optional back because it's the first fifty dollars. It's real easy. It's the first fifty dollars. An extra fifty dollars goes back to your county. Right. They don't if transfer the they don't transfer the other parts back. I think they don't. They don't say. transfer the other parts back. They send that seventh cent to if if somebody goes and buys a a, a vehicle in Palm Beach County. They send that fifty dollars to us, but they don't send the they don't send the, the, the half first cent six of the cents. six. They don't send the half cent. Okay, back uh, the half cent. Yes. Mm. Okay. And they only pick it up on registered things, okay. right? RVs, okay. it's it's right. Those big cars. Purchases. All right. If, if Thank somebody you. yeah, if somebody goes down shopping to you know or to Orlando and buys something fifty bucks, and nothing gets sent back here. But if it's a, a vehicle or, or a boat or something like that, it does. Yep. And same thing on all, all internet purchases by residents in the county. Nobody pays any on 
probably 99.9% of those purchases. Some of the travel sites now have kicked in the tax obligation, but it drops into the point of destination or, or departure of the ticket, so we don't get any of that portion either. Right. Thank you, Mr. Brown. I've interrupted you at franchise fees. My apologies. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Franchise fees, we, we are seeing a... A, a slight increase, um, in the, and there is a timing differential here um, from the uh, from the current year. The reason you see up three percent from last year is we're slightly ahead of last year, but we're below the budget because of the lag time in, in collecting the franchise fee. So we've been through six months, but we've only got five payments. On the on the FPL franchise fee is the only one that will be a small amount lower than the others. How long is their current fee? in place before it can be revisited just to get everybody on the same playing field. I don't know, they're probably multi-year agreements with... That the, was a 30-year agreement. 30 I think it was done probably in 07, 2007, 2007 yeah. I want to okay. say, so, so 2037. <laughs> and, and they, yeah, the, the, what happened there, we were at 6% before that agreement, but there were some credits that they got, and so we just, it, okay. to simplify it, the credits were taken away and it went to, to 5.9. Optional gas tax. We are seeing a, a slight drop off there. We think with the with the higher gas prices, they do seem to be going the right way the last last uh, couple of weeks. But uh, but uh, with with higher gas taxes, also I, you know, personally, I'm just seeing more of the smaller compact vehicles vehicles getting better fuel economy. Uh, we've we've even seen there are some places where they're talking about trying to change up the gas tax formula because of hybrids or electric cars aren't you know paying their share or whatever. I think we're seeing some of that. That uh, uh, not suggesting that we should do anything like that, or we don't have authority anyway. Um, but uh, we're, I think it's a combination of more fuel-efficient vehicles out there and people cutting back their trips um, because of the rising gas prices. So we have seen a decrease there. Ad valorem taxes, we've collected almost 88% of the taxes at the end of March. Uh, we do budget 95% of those in accordance with state law. Um, that is... Our collections are actually up from about 86.1% last year through this period. Uh, so we're, we're running right in line there. Um, our taxes collected are down um, by about 4% uh, from last year. Um, and that's as the tax rate went down 4%. Uh, the board kept the millage rate the same. We've, we've avoided, uh, per, per board direction, avoided any increase in the millage rate. So we're collecting fewer uh, taxes there. Um, we're down 1.5%. Uh, year to date, uh, but that's because our collections are running slightly ahead. Traffic impact fees were up about 5% from last year. Uh, we have seen uh, some, some fairly strong growth there. We actually had, a, a, towards the end of last year, had, had some good growth there. Recreation, uh, we look at, uh, we always try and measure those as a, as a percentage of, of the expenditures that are collected. Um, North County Pool is almost 15% of expenditures, give or pool about 3%. Athletics a little under 16 percent. The all the other uh, recreation programs, uh, the pools, the Gifford and North County pool, they are they always lag the first part of the year because the end the way our fiscal year falls, uh, ending September 30th, the summertime obviously is the heavy use time for both of those pools, so they pick up and uh, typically uh, we receive 25 30 percent of the uh, the cost of the North County pool in revenues, and Gifford pool is is more like 10 to 15 percent. Uh, just a, a summary of the information that's in your backup. General fund, uh, we've received 69% of the total budget for, for revenues uh, at March 31st. Uh, we're at the midpoint of the year, so 50% of the way through. The reason that's ahead is primarily the property taxes, as, as I pointed out before. That's about two-thirds of the revenue for the general fund, and uh, so we've, we've collected 88% uh, of those. So that's that if, if you take that factor out, we're, we're running right on line. Um, expenses at 331, 51.3%, which is more than 50%. Uh, that would normally be um, a troubling factor. However, I point out two major factors uh, impact that. First is the tax collector's office. Uh, they're a fee officer, and they collect a commission on the property taxes that are collected up front. So we've paid much of those commissions already. However, at the end of each year, uh, I'm sure you'll recall uh, Carol Jean came in last last November, and you know we get a check back, so we get a credit for a lot of that back. So what you'll see is, if if you look at the budget at this point, the 
the, the tax collector's budget is, is over budget, but then at the end of the year, we get those excess fees back. We get $2.5 million or so back from, got $2.5 million or so back from our last year, and we'll get that same thing this year, and that will come within in line. Uh, same thing with supervisor of elections. The uh, constitutional officers, normally we give them, the other three constitutional officers get one twelfth of their budget at the first of each month. However, due to the nature of the supervisor of elections office and that we typically have our biggest elections in November and they need to prepare for those October time period, the, the supervisor of elections gets 25% of the budget the first month. And that's so that they, they have funds on hand to pay poll workers and, and cover those early uh, voting hours and, and, and all of the elections. That, that I'd also like to point out they call the tax collector fee officer. She's a fee officer to us. We subsidize the school board and the cities. They don't have to pay. We pay their collections. So it's a subsidy for them from us to them. I don't think they should call her uh, a fee officer. I've told the state that because the 60% the of the tax, people, taxes collected don't have to pay on their collections. We have to pay for them. So, I mean, why, call, why have a formula that exempts every, the majority of people? What did they say when you, when you told them that, Joe? They said they're tired of hearing it for 20 years from me. <laughs> <laughs> just checking, just checking. <laughs> I mean, which, which, which statute has to be changed to, to fix it? It's one, 197. 197. Yeah. Yeah. 197, and what it does, it gives a percentage of collections, and we pay it, but they exempt the school board, which I think is wrong, and the cities. I think everyone should pay a percentage of collections, right. and I just think that's the right if they're a fee officer. And... I know you guys may not. I think fairness is fairness. No, I, you're, I'm not make, making light of what you're saying necessarily about uh, I'm just good luck fixing it. Uh, well, that's one of those where you hire one of those great lobbyists in Tallahassee, and at 11.59 on the last day of session, they slip in something, and it's mm -hmm. done and over, and then they find out the next day. Also, we, because of that formula, we pay the property a lot more than the property appraiser's budget than they, they would them. have to. So wow. it would be a sizable... It would be a million dollars to you guys, a million and a half, two million. Yeah, it happens on both of those, tax collector and property appraiser. Pay the worth system. examining a, a potential strategy. I mean, that's how inside the rotunda on the last day of session is when all the surprise things you find out later happen. I mean, that's always how it's happened. Yep. That's Tallahassee. That's Washington. That's how those, you know, and there's, there's guys that are really good at making those things happen. That might be worth investing in. Thank you um, for that insight, <laughs> Commissioner Zorg. <clears throat> MSTU funds, similar thing. Halfway through the year, our, our revenues are 55.5% uh, collection of the budget. Uh, the reason it's a lower number there is the MSTU is uh, less dependent on property taxes than is the general fund. Uh, general fund, about two-thirds of the revenues come from property taxes, uh, and the MSTU fund is more like about 40%. We have franchise fees, and the, and the MSTU makes, makes up uh, about as much as the, uh, as the property tax now. Expenses are running right on line uh, at a little under 50%. Um, I will say, general fund MSTU, um, we did budget uh, a loss of about $1.8 in fund balance there. We think we'll do a little better than that this year. Last year we were fortunate; some things broke our way, and we had a, about a four hundred thousand dollar gain between the two. Um, this year, we're, we're, we've we've had some some adverse impacts. The the interest earnings uh, have have gone down a little more, and the Medicaid, which uh, Commissioner O'Brien's uh, up there uh, fighting for us to uh, not get hit by Medicaid again next year, but uh, we took about a five or six hundred thousand dollar hit in Medicaid this year. That is that is not helping us out. Um, at all in the, in the budget, um, and they're looking to add on another 600000 for next year. <coughs> Transportation fund, um, that's only 38% of revenues. The reason for that is uh, one of the major sources there is gas taxes. As I pointed out before, they're about 3% down, 3% below the budget, but also we've only received five months of that. Same thing with, with transfers from in there. So, so we're looking at, at about... Uh, uh, five um, five months in a lot of cases. There are some things that, that get billed um, in arrears, uh, traffic signal maintenance to the cities also. Um, not that they're behind. There's there's just that lag time in, in, in billing them for those expenses. So um, we're, we've got a, a net loss of about 
or about seven hundred thousand dollars right now. We anticipate that that fund will be pretty close to a break even at the end of the year. Um, may experience a, a, a slight loss, but uh, we're we're trying to make some adjustments to uh, to cover that. Emergency Services District, 68% uh, of revenues. Once again, largest uh, source of funding is property taxes. This this fund is actually more dependent on, on property taxes than any of the other funds. Um, expenses are, are running right in line with the budget. However, we, we, we did um, estimate about a $2.5 million use of fund balance here. Uh, with the adoption of the budget, we are working to improve that so it's not that much of a loss however we did have a have a fairly substantial loss uh, last year uh, in the emergency services district of, of about 1.8 um, which which we've we have, have stated we, we've got to turn that around make some adjustments to uh, to change that situation so so that is a concern there on the district uh, some of the other funds enterprise fund uh, building division is uh, is is seeing some profitability. As you know, last month we uh, the board approved an additional position to handle the uh, to handle the the increased activity. Our our revenues are up over 20 percent from last year, um, and uh, so we're sh we're showing a, a net gain there. But obviously, we've added that position, trying to trying to fill that position um, so that uh, so that we're responsive. Obviously. We don't want to be the holdup in any building activity. We don't want to be any impediment to economic uh, growth, and, and, and construction is one of our major industries. Obviously, hit very hard uh, during this uh, during this downturn, um, and so we're we're trying to, to catch up there. But a good good sign there is is that we are are experiencing a positive uh, net income. Golf course, we're we've got about a nine hundred thousand dollar gain right now. That is a little behind last year. We had some. Some uh, slower play in uh, in the November December time period. Uh, one of the things that was estimated was was impact from Hurricane Sandy. People people coming down later. Um, the rest of the year it has been on more in line with with the previous fiscal year. Uh, I will note this is after season. We, we will continue to to lose some funds uh, over the summer months with less play and, and the lower rates. However, uh, we've we've been experiencing good. Um, Good results there at the golf course. We had a seven hundred thousand dollar gain last year. That enabled us to pay back a lot of our debt. Our debt issue is is paid off in two thousand sixteen. We hope to maybe pay that off a, uh, a couple of years early. And if we continue to have these results, we we'll, we will be able to do that. We anticipate. And just want to point out, as I always do, um, that the golf course is fully supported by the fees. So nobody's tax dollars are going to support the golf course. Um, it is fully supported by by the uh, by the by the folks that play golf there, uh, landfill. Uh, we're about a little over two hundred thousand dollars ahead of last year. We did have a, a about a if if you peel away the the FEMA repayment, we had about a four hundred fifty thousand dollar loss. So we're so we're anticipating a, a minor loss this year. Uh, trying to make some some adjustments there uh, to uh, to limit that uh, fleet. We're about ten thousand below break even this year, which is which is Pretty minor. That's basically at break even, um, and we did reduce staffing there due to uh, to reduced work um, in that department uh, last month. So that should kind of turn that situation around as well. Shooting range is showing a, a minor loss of five thousand versus a twenty-two thousand dollar gain at this point last year. That doesn't seem to make any sense. I see. I'm getting some looks, and I'll, I'll explain to you why that's happened. Never been busy. Um, the shooting range has been very busy. What happened is we had the the baffles that had to be repaired there. We had, we were having a, a safety issue. That that work was done in uh, in March, and that was an expense of about forty two thousand dollars, kind of a one time hit. So if you peeled that away, we'd have a thirty seven thousand dollar gain. Uh, right. So we're if if we continue to see the the activity that we've seen out there over over the last uh, over the last year. Um, we would definitely uh, expect that to, to be break even. We we did have a break in re break even result last year, uh, and we anticipate the same this year, even with that forty two thousand uh, dollar expenditure for the baffle repair. I've got a quick question on that. Yes, sure. a couple things. One of them is, um, have we ever, or do we even think about actually taking the lead that is fired into the mounds and trying to um, sell that. We do sell the lead, but I don't know if we get all of it out of the mounds. But we do sell lead. 
I know we sell the casings, the brass, I, yeah, and it's, those are. I mean, it's, and I, that's. I mean, that's becoming a very important commodity right now with ammunition being scarce. People are loading their own rounds. We can look at it. But Let's but as, it. as far as the, the actual lead, and I don't know whether it would justify the downtime on a Wednesday to go in there and sift through it or how we would do it, but um, there has got to be a pile of money sitting there in lead and uh, in, in, the shooting, in, in the mound out there. Well, as far as the, uh, the, the casings, uh, as you, you reverted to, uh, <clears throat> historically we were getting about uh, $100 a barrel. Uh, bringing it over to the the annual auction at the sheriff's office, and uh, if you recall, we we made a signif significant move in having that done with an independent uh, recycler, and we are making a huge amount. Uh, Jason, can you can you throw those numbers? I I think um, we've gotten as much as eleven hundred dollars a barrel. About nine hundred. Yeah, it's, it's averaging nine hundred yeah. to a thousand dollars for that barrel. It's really climbed, you know. Once a time, one, at one time it was more like the the scrap value of the brass. But right now, we got we got some folks that are that are taking their shell casings and reloading them, and uh, and they've become quite valuable here. Well, we had uh, people responding to the auction, and it would be a list and saying, well, there's four barrels up at the uh, the range, and they would bid on it. They're blind bidding, right. mm -hmm. and uh, as as you 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 can embrace. Uh, when you can see it, feel it, touch it, and weigh it, and uh, that's where we've we've gone, and we've uh, made significant improvement there. As far as the lead, the lead is uh, is sunken into the berm. Mm -hmm. The berm is an infrastructure that has to be maintained, and I think every five years we're mandated to do the sweep, the combing, and pull it out. That might be an excellent suggestion, but I don't know how much of of, of a uh, uh, financial commodity the lead would be it's not high up on the charts as uh, as aluminum and brass but it, it still could be a, a savings as opposed to just discarding it uh, according to the EPA standards right we can look into that I think we uh, in our agreement with our concessionaire agreement with the state um, we kind of turn that over to them I think I'll, I'll look at that I know yes. we have to pay a lead remediation fee on every on every uh, entry fee that that comes into there um, and if I'm not mistaken, it's every five years and then ten years it has to be all combed out. Right. But we can look into is there something else we can do differently if, if there's, if there's a, a way to, for us to, uh, to harvest that lead if there's, uh, if there's uh, a benefit and, and we can gain some value there. We'll definitely look at it. And with that said, um, I know we're going out to, uh, here, or let's say we've already, we're under evaluation, if I'm not mistaken, for the sporting place facility. Yeah, we've uh, ranked them. Like, yes, okay. we have. All right. Um, that, at what point, uh, Joe, I guess ultimately where I'm trying to get with these questions, would uh, it be very uh, forthright and, and genuine to actually move this from uh, the recreational side back into the enterprise side? I think once we start that up, uh, I'd like to give it six months to make sure before I move it and then have to okay. move it back. But uh, once we start up, you know, we start that up, give it six months, see how it's doing. If it's making a profit, we'll move it in. Okay. Sounds great. And I've re received nothing but uh, good comments back about the um, the additional personnel to run the uh, reg register so that people can shoot in the five stand, by the way. Yeah. Right. Right. And, um, and, and we, we will look at, at moving that to an enterprise fund, you know, once, once the sporting place is up and running. Um, but... And I do want to point out that even though it's not an enterprise fund, if it's breaking even today, it's not a burden on the taxpayers. Mm -hmm. So you know, and that that's one of the that's the one of the key reasons there. I think I think we're looking at enterprise fund. But as we sit here today, like last year, we had a minor profit, eight thousand dollars, something like that. So it didn't burden the taxpayer. So just like the golf course, the people using the shooting range are supporting it, and we're not not asking for any amount of money from the taxpayers. And I and I think that's that's a an accomplishment where where we wanted to be uh, when when we started the shooting range. Um, oh, one other question on the building enterprise fund. I know we're dealing with uh, the um, leaving of the building official, but before he leaves, I'm working with him to kind of um, quantify at what point what other positions might be needed. We also have four or five people in that department, longtime people in the drop program that are going to be leaving soon. Um, that'll be more for the new guy to kind of orchestrate a ahead of the curve type of replacement for those people. But um, the rollover problem with, with the limited staff when you have 
somebody's got to be in continuing education, somebody may be out sick. I think Monday they had 100 and 100 plus rollovers that they didn't get to. They do have the overtime capability, and that will work for a while, but at some point the momentum gets so big and the number of rollovers, even with overtime, becomes unmanageable to the you know, to the staff that's there to, to service it. So, um, and we want to make sure when it's not a, a random spike in activity that it's ongoing so that it'll tell us <coughs> once you hit this and this, we need to look at here's where our shortage is. Um, I know they have one particular person that's of a particular talent on commercial electric that if he's out, nobody basically in the county gets those type of inspections that particular day till that guy comes back. So. Um, it's unfortunate we're going to be having to, to seek out a new uh, building official, but before he goes, I'm going to try to gather as much information from him before he leaves next week. Let me point out, we've also, you authorized the hiring of an of additional person, which we, we're right now taking applications, and, um, and we're trying to fill those voids. Actually, you know, with the retirements become opportunities too, because I don't, during the peak, you look at Cape Coral, they laid off over 100 certified. There's, a, there's actually a glut of building inspectors or dual in the state because of the, the huge, um, during the, you know, the huge rise, everyone got certified, and uh, now they're, they're, so we think that there won't be that big of a problem hiring them unless the whole I think economy. it's a matter of when, when, is the, when do you pull the trigger on, on adding staff to, to keep up with the yeah. daily demand. And we're looking at that right now. What we're going to see what happens when we bring on the newest one that you that you the board has authorized. And, and that's one like we, we came back with a with a mid year ad. We, you know we we'll, we'll stay on top of that if right. if we determine there's you know we, we don't like to add positions mid year obviously. Um, however, in that area, if if there is an up a, a significant uptick where we're falling behind and we think it's sustained. And, or, and I don't know if that, that department, if, 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 if it would work, or in the interim, if the demand keeps building and rollovers keep occurring, even a, a per diem spot, so we're not making a full commitment, but we're paying to keep Smart. the inspection cycles current, and then if it continues, then you can look at making somebody a, a permanent fixture in the department. Smart. And, and as Joe mentioned, you know, we think there's some good opportunities out there because yeah. construction starting to come back a little bit, but... Obviously, there are a lot of folks out there, some well-qualified people that might be available to us. So we're we're prioritizing like that commercial electric certification, trying to make sure that we've got all of those. We're we're getting more and more certifications right. on the on the new people that that we're hiring to make sure that we we don't have gaps and that that we're well right. covered. And they might be familiar with the new software that we're trying to bring on. Right, and that's mm -hmm. hopefully that'll be. Yeah, it's that knowledge of being lost of what Jose had worked on with the new software program. Hopefully, somebody that applies will have had some history with that, but we're one of their early customers, so that may not potentially be possible. Good point. Good point. All right, and that's it for me. If, if you've got any other questions, uh, I'm available. Well, it says questions, comments, uh, but comments. Uh, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Brown, uh, for a, a, a robust uh, presentation and entertaining all of our questions during that presentation as well and not getting off course. All right. Thank you. Staying and on. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further, gentlemen? Um, let's try to bring the next item on the agenda, um, which is uh, – Public Works, Golf Carts, Roseland Area Roadways, Memorandum dated April 16, 2013, found on pages 132 through 133. Good morning, Mr. Mora. Good morning, Commissioners. Chris Mora, Public Works Director. Uh, back at one of, in one of the March meetings, March 19th exactly, uh, the Board asked staff to look into um, potentially allowing uh, golf carts to be used within the Roseland area. Uh, currently, under state law, uh, regular golf carts, battery-driven golf carts, are prohibited uh, for use on public roads unless the city or the county uh, basically does a study and determines that those roads in that area are safe for golf carts. Um, before you can and designate an area safe for golf cart travel, uh, city or county must determine um, many factors. One, Some would be the 
uh, volume of cars that use those roads, the speed of those vehicles, the types of vehicles. And what they're looking for is you have to determine that if golf carts are, are mixed into the existing traffic, would it be safe uh, for golf carts to travel? Now, staff looked uh, throughout the county, uh, and we did find two areas uh, where golf carts are currently allowed. There is an area uh, within the city of Vero Beach, and it's basically the central to, to the South Beach area within those boundaries that you see on the screen between A1A uh, and the ocean and from Flame, Flame Vine Lane on the south to Tulip Lane on the south, there is a city ordinance that was passed that allows golf carts to be legally used on those roadways. Does that include A1A? Does not include A1A. Does that include Ocean Drive? It does not include Ocean Drive. But it does include Flame Vine and Tulip and all of the intersecting east-west streets mm -hmm. and also a Club Drive within okay. that area. Uh, you can legally uh, use those roads and also um, there's a crossing on A1A that's designated for golf carts. It leads from the a golf course west to the uh, second phase of Riamar. Mm -hmm. And some roadways within Riamar that are public roads, you can also use uh, golf carts legally on those streets. Is so that there is of special uh, signage? No. We, we looked at this area that's uh, bounded by those four roads. We didn't see any special signs. Uh, there are truck restrictions in those areas, but we didn't find any special signs that would say golf carts are, no are allowed. <laughs> and the, um, in, in talking with the city about this, they said that ordinance was recently passed to clean up an old uh, 1984 ordinance that was on the books, and they wanted to uh, clarify it, basically. Uh, there are, uh, so, so within that area, uh, golf carts can be, uh, can be are, are permitted and can be driven on the road. What's the density of that, Chris? Any idea? Just to, I'm just trying to think of the number of houses kind of thing. Would it be a, a similar to our, our, our Rose 4 zoning? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the density is in there. I think it's all just single family. But, uh, well, no, there are some, there are some uh, apartments in that yeah, area. But yeah, but it, it, in reality, it's probably less than a unit per acre given the golf course. Mm. Well, there's no golf course in here. <coughs> yes, there is. Yes, there is. Just yes. This is right around the golf course, which is why I think it, it, it uh, happened there. I mean, the golf course is... Riamar Golf Course plays in the middle. Right of inside that okay. rectangle. All right. Okay. Uh, there is also an area uh, in the vicinity of the Vero Beach Country Club where, although gar golf carts are not allowed along the road, they are permitted to cross the road. And these are areas where the golf cart uh, pathways that are within the golf course uh, line up uh, with other areas where the golf carts might want to cross the road. And, and in this area, they have golf cart crossing sides, either golf carts ahead or, or golf carts with an arrow pointing down at where the crossing point would be. In the, um, in the Roseland area, it's a little bit different in that the Roseland area is, is mainly residential. There is some commercial industrial uh, areas within there, but it's a mix it's a mix of types of streets. Uh, you have some roads, that are, this is the area on the south or west end of Bay Street. Uh, there are paved roads, there are unpaved roads, there's two lane roads, there's single lane roads. So it's a mixture. Um, you can see on where the, um, the red circle is, you can see there there's a pickup truck pulling a trailer on a, on a paved road. And if I blow that up a little bit, you can see that he takes almost all of that paved road, which is just basically a single lane road. So when staff looked at the possibility of putting golf carts on these roads, we were very concerned about the width of the roads. If a cart, golf cart should approach uh, someone on a single lane road, one or the other is going to have to get off the road. Uh, in some areas, there's swales or ditches quite close to the edge of the roadway. We didn't, we didn't feel that that was a good mix. Uh, and also, golf carts have different travel characteristics in an automobile. They're slower, they're, uh, it takes longer to accelerate and decelerate and brake. So uh, overall, in evaluating uh, whether or not we thought golf carts could safely um, be operated in rolls, and we had some reservations, um, we felt that in general many of the roads would be too narrow uh, to accommodate two lanes of traffic. 
uh, and that would possibly set up some conflicts between golf carts and regular automobiles. Uh, we also looked at the safety involved. We pulled uh, the accident reports for the Roseland area, and we found a fatality uh, that occurred in 2009 when an automobile uh, rear-ended a golf cart. What, what time of the day or night was that? That was at night. And what was that on Roseland Road? That was on Roseland Thank Road, you very much. 125th. Uh, but nevertheless, if you allow golf carts in the Roseland area, I think you would be setting up crossing points on Roseland Road where these, where these carts would want to cross between the two halves of of the roads and Does the Vera Beach ordinance allow uh, to cross any of the roads like at midnight also? Well, they, they do have crossing points, like I mentioned. No, I mean, yeah. but is there a certain time of day when they're allowed to ride and not ride? No, no. It, they can ride it at does night? does not specify time of day. Okay. So our, our recommendation is that after reviewing the roads and area roadways and the, and the speed and volume characteristics of traffic, we felt that the existing uh, restrictions under state law should remain in effect and that no no changes or allowances for golf carts should be allowed to stop. Now, of course, if I were able to write this ordinance, I'd say because the roads are, or, you know, make this recommendation, I'd say because they we didn't have golf cart allowances, the guy had to go to the dump with his uh, pickup truck versus his golf cart. And because the road up there is narrow, we ought to allow golf carts so that way people, you can get two golf carts going like this on a road that we don't have to improve. Um, I guess really my question right now would be to uh, Mr. Blackwich. Let's suppose that um, we bring this up to the Roseland community and uh, there's a substantial amount of support for it. Where would the, and this board moved forward with it, um, with this recommendation right now. Where would that put us if somebody did get hurt up there? <coughs> um, I think generally the liability of the county would be pretty remote under these circumstances. I mean, you have authority under the statute to permit golf carts. Now, you do have the duty before you can do that to consider, as it says, factors. Um, well, the county must first determine that the golf carts may safely travel on or across the public road or street, considering factors including the speed, volume, and character of motor vehicle traffic using the road and street. So. You know, if you in good faith made that decision, um, you would have a decent defense. But on the other hand, you know, would you be named in a case? You might very well be named that you, you know, essentially did not properly consider those factors. You know, I, I look at the barriers here, and I, th I think that they're, you know, unlike the, the area in, in Central Beach, you have the North County Conservation Area, you have the railroad tra uh, to the south, you have the railroad tracks to the east. You've got the St. Sebastian River to the north. And you, you basically have, um, well, the airport. And then you have, I'm trying to think of what, where it ends. As you go further to the west, you kind of really run in almost to Donald McDonald Park or, or a certain, you know, outside really of the, the Roseland community of the A.A. A. Berry area. And when you look at those geographic uh, boundaries, it's a lot different than what they have in Vero whenever you're, because there's actually traffic coming off of Ocean Drive through these areas, the right. central beach. It, it, it is a more confined area because of those boundaries. It, it's, 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 like a, it's like a traffic enclave, in my opinion, right. whenever right. I look at it, because there's, there, there's only one road that goes through there. And that one road there, um, is Rosen Road, and I will admit that there are some uh, elevated use of traffic on that, but it certainly can't be like A1A in my opinion. And of course these, I, I, whenever they say it's a boundary, they still have golf carts going across A1A, and I'd just about lay that traffic count against Roseland Road and say A1A's got more traffic than Roseland Road. I may be wrong, but I think we would both agree that if we were to classify them as uh, whatever we classified those roads as, whether it be arterial or whatever we use them for, they should have about the same classification in our, at, at, at the MPO level. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I, I appreciate what you put in front of me here, but um, I, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, I, res I respect your opinion, but what I would like to do, commissioners, if um, unless y'all want, want to straight up kill this and I don't have support for it, um, I'd like for perhaps us to take this up to the Gifford or not the Gifford community, the Roseland community, 
and uh, and lay it out and, and let's get some of their feedback about Mr. it. Uh, I that, thank you, uh, Commissioner Davis. Uh, Commissioner Solari. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to take the opposite stance of uh, Commissioner Davis this time. Sorry, Commissioner. And I'm actually going to make a motion to move stack recommendation. There are a number of reasons for this. One is we don't have any of these places in the county today, and I think that once we open this box, we open to, to having golf, these <coughs> golf things in any similar type of area, which in my mind increases the safety problems, enforcement problems, and it's just a, a box I don't think we ought to open. There's the, historically, I think that the locations in Vero Beach were open to golf carts simply because there were golf courses there. So there was some reasonable uh, basis for it. Uh, you're, I'm going to guess the Roseland area is like some other areas in the community where you're going to end up mixing much older citizens, grandparents with children, which I think is a dangerous mix. And uh, I'll just note that it, one day I actually, despite what you all think about my driving, in Old Riamar, stopped exactly at a stop sign that was blocked by some hedges. As, but most people generally go up about 10 feet so they can see past the hedges. And just as I stopped, a golf cart came around the corner, cutting inside the, my driving lane. And if I had done what most people do is just drive up past the hedge, which would be really reasonable so you can see the oncoming traffic, that pers person would have been severely injured or dead. So given those things, I just don't think that, you know, given that we're responsible for people's health and safety <coughs> in this community, that this is a good idea. Well, I'll second that for discussion, but you've already provided uh, a, a rather formidable discussion. I'd like to also hear from the sheriff as well before we uh, make, make a vote on that. Commissioner Zork. Well, I did. Was, was Wesley's as an actual motion what he was talking to staff on? Well, no, I, I guess he wanted to say that one more time, Commissioner. Oh, what you had suggested, was that in the form of a motion? Um, as far as taking, let, getting some input from the Roseland community? Yeah, they might not like it. I, but, you know, the, I've heard just from about two or three people that would like this. And, uh, you know, then they just said that they would like to have the opportunity to do so like Commissioner Solari. And I said, well, I don't know what he's going to say, but we'll bring it up. Well, knowing that that was a motion, I would, I would second that. But now we already have a second. Yeah. Well, no. Uh, well, uh, that was uh, that was not made in the right. form of right. a motion. Right. That's what I was. No, it wasn't at, it the, right. point, okay. at that time. At and I want to clarify that because right. we did not ignore a motion. If right. there was a motion, it would have been entertained and right. okay. duly sought for a second. I was, I was what I was kind of hoping is that the, the Commissioner Slory's motion wouldn't get a second until we got to the point where at least we had some input from the community about it after getting some input from staff. But we can either uh, go ahead and vote on this. And uh, if it passes, well, you know, then obviously it's a dead issue as far as I'm concerned. But if it doesn't, then I'd like to circle back around with the friends uh, with the uh, Roseland Community Association and uh, just get some of their input on it. And because and, there, no, nobody's here about this today, right? And I think that that uh, kind of stifling the debate for a community that asked me to bring this forward, right? And I wouldn't want to be a part of stifling any of the debate. No, no, and we would we would want that either, uh, Sheriff. Uh, <clears throat> Commissioners, for what it's worth, uh, you may want to research, uh, I think it's statute 316 that talks about the intent of golf cart, golf carts traversing in the proximity of an actual golf course. Uh, and that's how the law was established many years ago. So I think that uh, absent a golf course in Roseland. No, there's one, there's one at the Sebastian Airport. Well, I think is, you have to look at that statute is, and talk about the proximity they play golf of how, there as well? how a golf cart can travel. All right. Thank you. They, but they do have some golfing there as well, do they not? At the at Roseland? Yes, in Sebastian. We do have a golf course. Oh, yeah, that's what I said at the airport. So that's what there's a need for it because it does. Thank you, Sheriff. Um, and, and that's my concern, too. This is... Uh, and I've spoken to a few people in, in, in Roseland regarding this, and, and I respect the fact that it's, it's your district that people wanted to uh, discuss it. There are only a few that I've, I've heard from that would like that or want it as opposed to need it because there's a golf course there. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the element of public danger, the uh, uh, uninsurability of a golf cart that's not specifically designed for a roadway uh, has to come more into play. Uh, for the safety and security of the citizens, the the insured and uninsured. I'm not necessarily concerned about the liability of the county approving this status so that we could have golf courts as much as the personal safety and security that I think will lie in the balance by having a battery-operated, low-speed, 
low responsive golf cart that has limited visibility and may be operated, there is no regulation, so it may be operated by those that would not otherwise be able to operate a motor vehicle on a local street or roadway. There might be a little bit more extension and uh, liberal approach about, well, kids, go get it on the golf cart and uh, take, take the rubbish over to the uh, uh, convenience center. Uh, that might be convenient. It might be appropriate in a far more rural environment that had uh, closed roadways. I don't think that's the case. I'm not really fond of the electric golf carts inside of subdivisions that are gated because you still have vehicular flow. But on a public street that we are uh, responsible for, for the public safety, I think we have to uh, hold that stance and uh, limit the uh, vehicular flow of an electric golf cart on a roadway that was designed for specifically uh, vehicular <coughs> flow. And I do have a concern about, uh, you, you mentioned diesels. Uh, there, there's a lot of diesel dualies out there, and, uh, and they should be out there, and they are on the roadway legally and lawfully, and I think that that's no match for a fiberglass battery-operated golf cart that we would be able to uh, allow the opportunity for someone that's licensed to drive but also an unlicensed driver to be able to drive that golf cart and then have it match up with a, uh, a several ton vehicle. I, I, I think that uh, we, we can forget about the, the liability, the financial liability and the lawsuit and uh, hold back to what's right and what's needed for the community and we need to provide a safe community. Thank you. And that was the nature of my second. So we have a motion on the floor and a second. Do we have any further discussion? Okay, motion by Commissioner Solari, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion fails uh, two to two. That's correct. So um, what I'd like to suggest we do, uh, Commissioners, is um, probably uh, maybe bring this issue up to the uh, Roseland Community Association at one of their meetings and, uh, and talk about it, find out, you know, if the entire community is really something that they could support, whether finding something halfway between to where the road, the uh, uh, carts can't go on Roseland Road at all. Um, and, 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 of course, with there is another commissioner that's absent, so it, it uh, affords us that the opportunity for him to hear the discussion and also hear staff side perhaps one more time. And if uh, I'll second it if we can add in to ask the county attorney to look up the statute that the sheriff mentioned, <clears throat> sure. if, it, if it's even possible by sure. state law. Yeah. But understand, I'm seconding you for to keep the discussion moving. And, and, I, and I doubt I, that I would be favorable at the time, but maybe the yeah. residents from Roseland can, can explain me differently. I'll, I'll certainly do that. I'll hook you up with them. And uh, Appreciate that. They, they will educate you in District 1. How's that? Uh, well, with a clear conscience, and I'm familiar with uh, uh, many of them, with a clear conscience, uh, I, I will state the same, that I will not be supportive in the future. Um, I, I still feel that safety and security has to prevail, and uh, 316 uh, will, will prevail as well, and I'd like to include the sheriff. Uh, I'd like to invite the sheriff. Uh, are you going to be holding this meeting, or would I realize we all can't be there? Yeah, we, we can if we advertise it, but the, um, I, I won't, will not be uh, hold, hosting the meeting. It will be during a time that's convenient for the uh, Roseland well, if invited, you'll be there. Absolutely. If I'm invited, I'll be there. If, if we're invited, we'll, we'll have to uh, uh, notify council, and uh, it'll be a public notice meeting. Um, I would like to, if the Roseland community is going to uh, have that type of meeting, uh, I most certainly would uh, be willing to attend. I'd like to uh, extend the invitation to the sheriff as well to address some of the safety and security issues that uh, we are uh, uh, talking about today. That was my motion then. Your motion and seconded by Commissioner Solari. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, four to zero. And Mr. Chairman, can we have five? Uh, we, we can do that. We have a limited amount of material left, but uh, let's take five. Okay. Thank you.
suggested that you uh, say that <laughs> Call it back to order. Uh, the next item on the agenda is uh, from Commissioner Zork, uh, which is the calendar on the county's website memorandum dated April 17, 2013, found on pages 134. Commissioner Zork. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> this item was brought up after <coughs> I had uh, a number of individuals come forward, some actually one constitutional officer and uh, some members of the city saying, do we have a centralized place where we can have an ongoing, evolving, kind of like an online calendar format where the users could subscribe to the updates to this calendar, automatically be sent new things. So I met with um, Jason Brown and the, the guys in the IT staff yesterday, and they're gonna bring some ideas back how we can have a, uh, a virtual calendar in a subscription arrangement where people can sign in to receive the updates for these different public meetings. And when you look at them, there is quite a collection of them and to find where each of them are actively, um, a lot of them are repetitive in nature. In other words, EDC meets whatever it is, the second Wednesday of every, every month. So once they're loaded up, it's not gonna be um, as cumbersome, but initially um, it'll take some loading. Also every Friday, Scott, uh, takes and loads all the new meeting and room assignments for the prior week for the weeks going forward. So we already have somebody that's kind of loading this information. It's just making it more publicly available, similar to the way uh, Dory in your office, Joe, sends out the, um, the agenda once it's prepared, it automatically goes out to a list of people who have asked to be put, put on the list. This would be kind of uh, self-service. You wanna receive the updates, put your email in here where you want it sent to. And Jason, do you have anything else to add from yesterday's? Uh, no, I'll just say that, that we did meet with uh, Commissioner Zork and, and we think we can provide some solutions that will, that will do what you're talking about at li little to no cost. Uh, just, just the time uh, involved to set it up um, and, uh, and we think we can have it a, an automated process once, right. once we get going and, and we can send those notices out. Great. Thank Thank you. Talking, when you and Jason were discussing this, did you come across any more committees we could get rid of? Well, we did jokingly talk about that, looking at how many that there are, um, and we thought that you might even have some suggestions today. Oh, maybe I'll, uh, I'll get with Jason and see if we can come up with a few more to get rid of. would be happy to work with him. <laughs> That's it. So um, once we kind of get this idea going forward, the idea is, one, the least amount of staff time to get it set up, uh, maybe a little bit of effort in the beginning, but kind of make it is automated and self-publishing back out to the subscribers so that um, uh, like on the bus hub discussion meeting that was noticed in the normal procedures, the tax collector's office didn't figure it out till the day before that it was coming and that's somebody you would think would be pretty proficient on figuring out meetings. And then also, um, but that, that's just one example. There's, I've had quite a few. So basically you're look, looking at an enhancement of what we're already doing right. to ensure that everyone has fair and equal opportunity to be able to see this and be noticed. Uh, and are, we, are we talking about outgoing communication as well? Well, it would be, at, let's say every Friday at five, whatever the calendar is for the week going forward, if you subscribe and said that you'd like to receive updates, it would just automatically send it out to them. Uh, Joe, can, do you see that as uh, as far as outgoing in, into the subscription? I know that we did that with the weather alerts as well when uh, we were doing the Office of Emergency Response, and people can sign up for their their uh, uh, notices to go out their automatic emails. Uh, is that akin to what we had? Yeah. Yes, that would be, you, only for those that asked to receive it would get it, it wouldn't be an automatic, you'd have to go there and read it. Right, right. Yeah, 
Right. Well, that Do says it. a lot about your friends, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I, I mean, I Just 25% of them. Yes. <laughs> this is perfectly consistent with everything that yes. the board has done over the last years to be as open and transparent as possible. Absolutely. And it may in the end just make the county job easier for us. So if that was a motion, Commissioner Zork, and if you want a second, I'd be happy to second it. Yes, that would be great. We have a motion on the floor by Commissioner Zork and seconded by Commissioner Solari. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Motion passes unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner O'Brien absent. And, and maybe it be information overload, um, but I know that Dory always uh, sends out the agenda outline, then the agenda, mm -hmm. and it might be appropriate, uh, and that's typically every Friday. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to do that as an attachment at the beginning of the agenda, just for the, the, the week of maybe that without having to reinvent the wheel on this, just send it out to those people and then have a way. Do you want to receive a e copy of the uh, of the county agenda? You just enter in your email address right there on the county's website, and it adds to her database. Right, but it'll be yeah, fairly accurate. Yeah, but it's, at that point, they'll say, well, this one you didn't send, so you want to be careful, you want to be this point or not. Right, sure. the, the yeah. emergency yeah. items or additions, last minute and, additions. And, you know, not nothing's going to be as fresh as sitting here watching us do it, but just some kind of effort to, I'm just, you know, right. that may be easier than what you're talking about. One thing I'd like to, to, to add to that uh, as far as uh, printing out the agenda uh, perhaps maybe we'll reduce the amount of trees we're cutting down by supplying the printed agenda and maybe perhaps the, the media will subscribe and then we won't have to have a printed copy upstairs as well for all uh, uh, efforts of the, the media. But uh, what, what I found is you can't just copy one page. You have to initiate, a download the agenda and then copy the entire agenda. So I'd like to see if they, there's some way we could have just, again, for argument's sake, if someone has something happening in a specific area that would like to just copy that agenda item, they'd have the ability to do so. No, that you can. I not think. Just... Well, that's what we, there was a, a link of, no. here's the, this meeting's coming up. To look at more information on that meeting, go to the, you know, well, how to direct them to the it's, it's agenda there. listing. Right. You break it down into. Yeah. And then if you just want to print the pages, all you got to do is go to print like that, and then it says what pages, and it says all right there. All you got to do is put in like 77 to 35 and push OK, and it'll print just 77 to 35. They, they can't navigate on, on. Right, because there might be. All right, say, say that complaint to me one more time. And that'll bring up the agenda? Yeah. Oh, you just want talking about doing a hyperlink on the calendar. All right. Back to the committee listings that are already scheduled. On, right. 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 So if you want, if you want to, I got you. It'll now say, you may, it'll say on Board County the, Commissioner's meeting, and then if you, then you click on that, and it'll give you the agenda. Now, that's only if, if, if they get it, uh, let's say, this Friday. They want to look at the commission agenda. It won't be posted till. Well, that one would be posted for the coming, but the following one, they'd have to understand that the agendas are only prepared X number of days yeah. in advance. What I, I understand what you're saying, and what I find a little hard to, to follow is you have to, when you're going to the website to look at the county's agenda, you've got to click on the Board of County Commissioners versus it saying County Commission Agenda. It ought to have its own link right there. You, then you've got to click on the Board of County Commissioners, and then all of a sudden, then it goes to week, the meetings, and then it, somewhere on there it should say Agenda without having to go two clicks in. Well, again, I, I, you can step you through that? No, in the okay. same way, why don't you just go, you're on the website right now. Right. Commissioner Davis is on the website. Why don't you find out when we could recycle today? Or we, what convenience center we can go to? Well, today's, all of them are open. Uh, no, uh, no, excuse me. No? You no, cannot go closed. to, uh, Felsmere is open, so Winter Beach is closed, so you've got to go to Felsmere. Well, that's correct. Mm -hmm. But could you find that on the, on the website? Hmm. That's what I'm saying. Yes, I got it's not in my hard drive. to be able to get to that point. Uh, what what and then you have to know where it's under. So I think we it's we need to there. make that a little bit more. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. We're getting into a broader approach. Actually, of committee what the and, and is. noticed committee and noticed meetings of that would cover your special call thing, which would be noticed but not automatically scheduled. If if the like the bus hub discussion that was noticed, then it would get dropped into the calendar. And right now, Scott takes every Friday and enters kind of an ongoing list of future meetings. So he's we can take that and maybe look at updating that listing and posting of meetings and events to go into the calendar format and then um then for the, the calendar link. click to the hyperlink of the agenda for that meeting i got what you're saying right i like it i think overall the the, the county has enhanced the uh the uh, user friendliness mm -hmm. of the uh, website and anything believes it needs more right i believe Always that we need to evolving. enhance and 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 look at this and uh make it a little bit more user friendly so that the average person can just click on the website and find exactly what they need. Have a, a button for just about everything you need to look at. You know, we pretty much have that. Did y'all see that? Yeah, we do, but sometimes you have to do a little research to get to that button. No, it says weekly meeting schedule right up at the top. Right. right? And That's the ones that they manually enter and then, every Friday of the going forwards. Right. And then we've got the technical review committee and all that kind of stuff, and then it's got agenda off to the right. And then you click on that and the TRC agenda comes up. Is it taking that but putting it in a a calendar format versus a list <coughs> format. Gotcha. Just so we won't be doing much additional work because we're already doing that. Right. It's there. It just has to be recalled right. a little bit. And you can even down. Oh, new. It says download a 30-day meeting schedule. How about that? There you go. I think they're probably working on this just from your conversation yesterday because it says new. We'll probably be done by the time we're finished talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> Anything further? Commissioner Zork, you have an additional item. The uh, yes. Indian River Lagoon Symposium Memorandum dated April 17, 2013, found on page 135. Yes, the um, kind of the, the ongoing, I've had people ask, well, when is the next event meeting place going to take place on the symposium? And I can tell you the three dates that will not take place. It will not take place on July 17th, 18th, and 19th because of the budget hearings. Um, we are looking at a midsummer uh, type time frame, but that boxes that out. Uh, we're also looking at uh, facility location uh, coordinators to help um, this event come together. It's still evolving of who will be the uh, what I call the scribe coordinator, the ones taking in the information from the participants. And what we will envision is a a working group of about 20 what I call stakeholders of different different degrees. Uh, but there will be an audience seating area in the room. They will not be active participants on the uh, the information that the group of 20 will be <coughs> carrying forward of the working group's efforts. And then the goal of this is to have this document, whatever is uh, actually a document slash plan of ideas, uh, that it would exit that group, come to the commission for discussion and adoption and then coordinate with the public works office which we've talked about of how to take whatever the items are that they deem as the most beneficial items that would uh, benefit variety aspects aspects of the lagoon and then work on an implementation schedule on those some will be funding requests grants some will be plan tracking what other agencies are doing um, and then the group would be ongoing meeting every quarter, kind of ongoing indefinitely until things are, um, even if the lagoon is in good working order, I think it still would need a good maintenance uh, uh, maintenance plan. So that's the, the update. Um, we're still looking at a July date based on, again, facility availability and participants availability. We have not sent out a contact list. We have about 100 people that would like to be but the, the recommended group from some of the facilitators is 20 or less is the ideal manageable number to extract the information. And um, so I'll keep you posted as that moves forward. And that's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Zork. Appreciate it. Uh, next item on the agenda is the special districts and boards, the solid waste disposal district approval of the minutes meeting of March 19, 2013. Move to approve the minutes Second. of March 19. Uh, a motion on the floor by Commissioner Solari, seconded by myself. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, four to zero, with Commissioner O'Brien absent. And the next item is the final pay for Geosyntec uh, 
uh, work order number four, engineering and construction support services for phase two construction of cell one of segment three expansion, memorandum dated April 10, 2013, found on pages 136 through 130, 148. Move payment for final invoice. Second. There's a motion on the floor by uh, Commissioner Solari, seconded by myself. Any discussion, gentlemen? Nice presentation, Mr. Burke. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries four to zero with Commissioner O'Brien absent. <coughs> gentlemen, meeting adjourned. Thank you.